everybody. My name is Matt Robinson. I'm the discipleship minister here. It's wonderful being uh, able to share this time with you this morning. Uh, those princess ballets, the, the princesses ballet was wonderful. It was great. We're going to start off this morning with a pop quiz, though. Is everybody ready for a pop quiz? Everybody's going to break out in some cold sweats now. Um, okay, we're, we're going to go through some, some famous quotes, some famous speeches. We want to see how, how you all do. So listen to this quote, see if you can, you can finish it. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth in freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people... I hear some people say it louder. All right, shall not perish from the earth. Good job. That was Abraham Lincoln. That was the famous Gettysburg Address. Let's let's see if we can wake up a little bit more, see if we can get another one. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but... Daniel, I'm sorry, you were wrong. That was close. Uh, By the content of their character, and that is Martin Luther King Jr., another incredible, powerful speech. All right, let's see. Let's see if everybody can be up up to this one. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Yeah, that's a famous message. That's JFK. Let's see. Let's see if we can do this one. All right, last one. I know that I can't take no more. It ain't no lie. I want to see you out that door, baby. Daniel, you got that one. That one was correct. Good job. That was in sync. A little disappointed that you actually got that one, Daniel, but congratulations. Those, those are some pretty famous speeches. Maybe, maybe not that last one. But, but those are some pretty, pretty famous speeches, and, and they're, they're memorable for these reasons. We remember them for these reasons. The person that said it was historically significant. The speech itself was historically of great importance. And, and the, the time that the speech was given was a historically significant time. Have you, have you ever gotten a weird voicemail on your phone? You, you get a voicemail and you, you don't know at all why the voicemail is on your phone, or maybe you can't understand it, or maybe it's just crazy and weird. I've got about a dozen messages on my office phone that I still to this day do not know what they're about, but they're so much fun that I, I haven't deleted them off my phone because they just make me laugh so much. At the start of Mark's uh, biography on the life of Jesus, John the Baptist is a weird guy with a a weird message. But just because the message is unusual and the person giving it is unusual or unexpected doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention. He shows up in the wilderness looking like a wild man and he's telling everybody to get ready because Jesus is coming, because God is coming. Who Who is John setting the table for? He's setting the table for Jesus. John was right. God had shown up in a a big way. Jesus had arrived, and we need to tune in because if we don't, we're going to miss Jesus altogether. Jesus wants us. He wants our attention. If we're not listening, we're going to miss it. Our series that we're going into right now is Let's Get Weird. And we're, we're looking at the life of Jesus And we're calling it Let's Get Weird because following Jesus isn't normal. It's weird. But that's okay because uh, normal isn't working. Why are we talking about Jesus and looking at the Gospel of Mark? We're talking about Jesus because Jesus is everything. He's why we're here today. He's why we have reason to live, reason to have hope. And, and honestly, if we're going to rescue God's people, then we've got to care about the people who aren't here even more than we care about the people that are here. We have to have the same heart and passion for them as Jesus does, who was in heaven but chose to give up his place in heaven to reach those that were lost. The purpose of the Gospel of Mark is to show that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who was sent to suffer 
and to serve in order, in order to rescue and restore mankind. Essentially, uh, you can break down Mark, the Gospel of Mark, into two halves. The, the first half, uh, about eight chapters, is Jesus typically traveling north and, and preaching and performing miracles. The second chapter, or second eight chapters, Jesus is essentially traveling south to Jerusalem as he's preaching and performing miracles. And then in the middle of, of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus asks the disciples who he is. And Peter answers that Jesus Christ, or that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. This is how it reads in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 29. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. There's that term again. We talked about this, this phrase last week on Easter Sunday, Messiah or the Christ. And, and we learned last week that this, this term means anointed one sent by God. So they were recognizing that Jesus was sent by God and anointed as their king. And in chapter one of Mark, God sends a, uh, ahead a messenger that st- sets the stage for Jesus. It's John the Baptist. And he has a message that he wants people to hear. So if you want, you can pick up with me in Mark chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. So if you have a Bible or if you have uh, the Bible on your smartphone, go ahead and get it out. And we're going to be walking through uh, a big section of it. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie." I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what was, what was John's message? John's message was, get ready. Someone powerful is coming. Prepare yourself, because something big is about to happen. And when he arrives, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We need to take a moment this morning and, and talk about baptism. Uh, I had a conversation with a friend recently uh, and we were talking uh, about baptism. Now, this was a, a friend of mine who, who hasn't ba- been baptized. He hasn't embraced Jesus yet. And as we were talking about it, he was talking about how it seemed like to him that baptism was really just a lot of pageantry, that it was a, a showy thing that he really didn't understand where it fit into the salvation work of God or why, why we chose to get baptized. In describing it, he felt like baptism was weird and that it was unnecessary. On the surface, I I see exactly what he's talking about. Uh, If it was just about announcing that you would be following Jesus, getting baptized is a really, really weird way to announce that. But that's not all it's about. Baptism is is an outward act of human obedience that, that God uses to symbolize an inward spiritual reality that God is taking care of. We've got to look just for a second at the word baptizo, which is where we get the word baptize. And it's a, a little bit unusual because we think about baptism in, a, in a, a church word kind of way, but the word baptize literally means to submerge under the water or to dunk. I mean, you can think about taking a cup and putting it all the way under the water. It might help you to think about it this way. If your mom told you to wash the dishes and you took a plate, and you never actually put it in the soapy water, but you just cleaned it off and then moved it along, she would say, you didn't baptize that plate. You need to dunk that thing. You need to put it all the way under the water, get it clean, and then you need to put it all the way under the water again and rinse it off. That's, that's what that word means. And so when, when they heard this, you know, when they were calling him John the Baptist, it was John the, the dunker or John the dipper. He was putting people under 
the water. And if you, if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that it wasn't just a John the Baptist thing. It was something that, that the disciples would do. If, if you look at Acts, you'll see a pattern of people repenting, which means to turn and face another direction. So they would, they would take their lifestyle and they would turn their lifestyle. They'd, get, uh, they'd believe in Jesus and they'd be baptized. And like I said earlier, I understand that this sounds like a pretty unusual way to, to declare that you're following Jesus or an unusual way to symbolize your obedience to Jesus, but this wouldn't have been a new thing to Jews in the first century. It wasn't even a new thing for, for them to come on the scene and see John say, prepare the way of the Lord and be baptized. Because Jews in the first century had something called the mikvah. And, and if you saw a mikvah, you would, you would look at our baptismal and you'd say that looks similar. You know, it was a small little wading pool that, that the Jews would have to go and wash themselves ceremonially uh, to be clean. If they had touched something that had made them unclean, if they had done something to make them unclean, to, to be in right standing with God or to be able to enter the temple again, they would have to go bathe in this mikvah. And so that's, that's essentially what John is doing, but he's doing it in a really weird and interesting way because he's all the way out in the wilderness and he's come to the Jordan River and he's saying, repent and be baptized. So he's saying, get yourself ready. John's baptism was for repentance, but he said another would come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He was talking about Jesus. For Christians, baptism is where we repent of our sins and we have them washed away. So there's a, a couple layers of symbolism in, in Christian baptism. The first symbol is we're being washed. Our sins are being washed away. But then the second layer of sim, uh, symbolism is the fact that we are being laid down. We are being buried to our old selves. And when we are brought back to life by Jesus, we are living for him. It is his presence, his spirit that lives within us. And so John came and he said, prepare the way, repent, make straight your path. So change the way that you're living, repent and, and correct your heart because Jesus is going to show up. Have you prepared yourself to follow Jesus? Have you, have you been baptized? For some of you, that just is something so far out of your comfort zone that, that you're, you've even said like, hey, I believe in Jesus, but I just don't get baptism. I'm just not going to do this. And really what it, what it is, it's a simple way. It's a simple thing that symbolizes so much. All we have to do is act in obedience, and Jesus is doing the spiritual act of renewal within us. We've got the small job, and God takes care of the big job. God is calling all of us to act in obedience, but are we listening? The NFL draft was this weekend, uh, some of you might have watched it, and some of you might have wondered why your husbands were watching TV for hours upon hours when really all they were doing was announcing names. But one of my favorite parts of the NFL draft is the call. You see, uh, when you get drafted, you get a call from either the owner of the team, the manager, uh, or you know, the coach, or you get a call from somebody saying, hey, we have chosen you. And what happens when that phone rings is the player will pick it up and everybody in their house has to get quiet. And they can't hardly be quiet because they're so excited. And so through, through like uh, hushed tones, the, the person is like, yes, yes, I'm excited to be on your team. I'm excited to be on your team. And then I don't know where the hat comes from, but they always have a hat for the football team that they got drafted by. And so they hang up, everybody screams, they start jumping around and he pulls this hat out and puts the hat on and he is joined this team. And it's powerful to watch. It's emotional to watch because these players have been trying for so hard for so long and they're seeing this dream be realized. In a way, baptism is like realizing that you've gotten the call from Jesus and you're putting your hat on saying, this is my team now. Our part is just obeying and accepting the gift. Jesus has done the legwork leg of being our sacrifice, choosing us, and allowing us to become part of his church. We've got to decide if we're going to put the hat on, though. We've got to decide if we're wanting to be on the team. 
Mark continues intr- introducing to us uh, Jesus in Mark chapter 1 uh, in, in that we hear Jesus' message for the first time. So, so he's introduced us to Jesus through ways of John the Baptist saying, get ready, he's coming. And now Jesus has shown up. Listen to what he says in verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended to him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. Did you, did you catch that little bit in verse 14? After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. John the Baptist shows up and introduces everyone to Jesus. And then he gets arrested. Okay? The crowds are, are coming to see John the Baptist, but now John the Baptist has announced Jesus, and now John the Baptist isn't on the stage anymore. He ends up being executed, and Jesus starts to preach. Entering stage left is Jesus. Exiting stage right is John. If you're a follower of Christ in here this morning, are you willing to introduce Jesus and then exit stage right? Are are you willing to say, here is who God is? Are you ready to make the sacrifice of not being in the spotlight in your life story anymore? Following Jesus isn't about us. It's not about you, it's not about me. Following Jesus is about the person that you're following. A God who loves us so much that he's willing to die for us. And for those, those of you in the room that haven't committed to Jesus yet, you aren't a follower of Christ, and you really are hearing a lot of this and you're going, that, that is weird. What I, want to hear, what I want you to hear me say is following Jesus doesn't solve all your problems. If you asked anybody here if all their problems went away the, the, the instant they gave their life to Christ, you'd have a lot of people that would laugh because life doesn't become easy once you sign up to follow Jesus. In a lot of ways, it, it gets harder. When you sign up to follow, follow Jesus, life gets weird. Life gets tough. And if you're thinking about making that decision to commit to Jesus, you need to be aware of that. That Jesus isn't a God who makes our problems go away. Jesus is the God we follow because through him we have an ability to survive our problems. He is so worth it. So John the Baptist has exited. Jesus has come. And this is what he says in verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What was John's message? John's message was, get ready. The kingdom of God is coming. And then Jesus shows up. And what's his message? The time is here. I am here. Have we missed that message? Jesus said the kingdom of God was here, but but was that all of his message or is there more? Let's keep reading and look at at verse 16 of chapter 1. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Hey, you fishermen, follow me. You're going to fish for people. I mean, like, we hear that, and we hear that with churchy ears, and we go, yeah, I'm going to be a fisher of men. Like, right on. Can you, can you imagine being a car mechanic and somebody showing up to your work while you're under the hood and saying, hey, come follow me and I'll make you a mechanic of people. Or, or if, you, <laughs> if, if you had another job and, and you were a farmer in a field and, and you're plowing the field and somebody walks out to you in the middle of this field, you're completely by yourself and they're like, hey farmer, come follow me. You're gonna harvest people. 
It's weird. It's not a normal thing to say. But, but what do the disciples do? They drop everything. They leave their dad. They leave their dad with the hired help. And like, dad, we're going we're gonna to follow him now. So it might have been a, a weird question, but these guys followed. And Jesus was right. Those fishermen helped the world catch hold of the message of Jesus. So what is Jesus calling you to do? He's calling all of us to follow him, and that means repentance and baptism. Then he takes our normal life, and he gives it a holy calling. So, so Jesus finds us where he is, and he, he challenges us to repent, to be baptized, to turn in our ways, to follow him. But then he speaks into our normal life calling something powerful, even if it sounds weird. When, when you meet Jesus, your job in construction becomes a call to build the kingdom of God. When you meet Jesus, your job as a mailman becomes a, a calling to deliver the good news of Jesus wherever your route takes you. When you meet Jesus, your job as a lawyer becomes a call to testify as to how good God has been to you. When you meet Jesus, your job flipping burgers becomes a calling to upsell everyone you can into the best extra value meal of grace you could ever imagine. You don't have to complicate your calling. Once we've answered the call from Jesus, that repentance, that act of obedience through baptism, living out our call should be a natural thing. It doesn't have to be complicated. Care Portal that Bart talked about earlier in the service is a great example of this. We've got some really exciting updates from, from the efforts of Care Portal this week. And, and honestly, if you have any free time after second service today to come back and, and take part in their meeting, you won't regret it because what they're doing is, is powerful. Many of you get regular emails from Care Portal where we're notified that there's a need in our community for a local foster family or, or for a family that's in crisis. And what our care team does, what our Care Portal team does, is they take those and they, they turn them around to our congregation, our church family, and they say, can anybody help? And it's amazing how small things that we have lying around our house that we're not using can go and impact other people in such a meaning, meaningful way. The bed in the picture was delivered to a mom with several children. She took in an 11 year old or 12 year old girl who is a family member and came with almost no belongings. It's remarkable that this mom took in this kinship placement because recently one of her kids had died unexpectedly. Bill Heeman and Keith Sims uh, showed up with a queen size bed that they lugged up uh, two precarious sets of stairs and totally made a 12 year old's day. She had been sharing a bed prior to this delivery, and now she has her own comfy bedroom. The day after that bed was delivered, Bill and Keith also delivered a gliding chair to a different family with a small baby. The mom called uh, Michelle, our, our care portal, portal team leader, in tears because she loved the new beautiful chair so much. Another recent delivery was to a grandmother who had recently given kinship care to two of her uh, to two of her grandchildren, a boy about one year old and a girl about five months old. And before the dresser arrived, they were living out of Rubbermaid uh, tubs, getting their clothes, getting everything they needed out of those. And she was so grateful. Small acts done with great love. Don't make it so complicated in your mind that you never act on following Jesus. Simple acts done with great love will change the world. I, I don't know what job you have in life, but God wants you to get busy fishing. And it might sound strange to you how your job could be repurposed into kingdom work, but when you bring Jesus along with you, when you listen to the message Jesus is speaking into your life, it's not going to be complicated sharing how good God has been to you with whoever you come in contact with. But Care Portal isn't our only opportunity to do that. You've got a chance right now to go sign up in the lobby for, for a Houston trip this summer where we're going to go and we're going to serve people that have been ravaged by, by a, a natural disaster. And we're going to help them in a meaningful way. What, what better way to say this is what Jesus is like than showing up and serving people? Another, another great opportunity to not just be a church in service, but to be the church 
in service is what Bart shared earlier in service too when he talked about serve day. You can go sign up for that right now. You can go find our latest newsletter, click on the link and sign up for it. Or you can take one of those cards right in front of you and fill it out. Say that you want to help with serve day and turn it in when the offering is taken up. It's not that hard. Some of us spend a lot of our time wondering what our calling is. God's called all of us to two things. He's called all of us to follow him, and that starts with baptism, and he's called us to be fishers of men. And we can do that whatever our job, whatever our skill level is, we can find a way to take the things we do and repurpose it for the kingdom of God. Just because the message is weird or because it's unexpected or it makes us uncomfortable doesn't mean we can ignore it. Jesus was sent with a message and we call it the good news. Are we listening to it? So looking at John, or looking at Mark chapter one, what was John's message? Repent and be baptized because the kingdom of God is coming. And what was Jesus' message to us? God's kingdom is here. Follow me, and you will be fishers of men. Whatever your job is, we got to get busy fishing. Find Jesus and get busy following him. We're going to enter into a, a time of worship. And as we enter into this, this time of worship, I want you to put your listening ears on. Whether, whether it's serve day, whether it's care portal, whether it's a trip to Houston, or maybe it's just a trip to your neighbor's house. Jesus has called all of us to take what he's given us and to share it openly with others. So please, please stand up. We're going to start this time of worship. And listen, because Jesus is calling and he wants us to answer.